Hoop Heads podcast is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. One day in practice at Manhattan College, I had a team that was 19 and 3. It was the middle of February, and you know, you guys know how the dog days are. And I and we were practicing on a Wednesday. We weren't playing until a Saturday. We were the best team in the league by far. And I said to my coaching staff, get ready because I'm going to throw the guys out of practice after five minutes today. <laughs> I, I want them to think that I'm unhappy, but I really am just giving them a day off. And so five minutes in, somebody throws the ball away. I, I put on this great act and go ballistic, which I did on occasion. So it was realistic. They thought I was really mad. And I just said, you know, I can't repeat the language, but I basically said, hey, you guys think you're better than you are. You're 19 and three. You think you got this made. You know, uh, I don't want to see you guys until tomorrow. So I kick him out of practice five minutes in. I go up to my office. Assistant coaches come up with me and they're laughing and joking. Coach, that was great. You had us believing that you were really, you know, really mad. Well, five minutes go by and one of the managers comes up and says, coach, um, they're still practicing. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, the, the guys just took the practice plan and they're practicing. So my assistant coach has said, should we go down there? And I said, no, it's not our team anymore. It's their team. Fran Fraschilla joined ESPN as a college basketball game and studio analyst in 2003. He serves as an analyst primarily on Big 12 men's basketball games, is a staple on ESPN's coverage of the NIT, and a regular on ESPN and ESPNU Studio. Frischilla also provides commentary for the NBA Draft, the FIBA Basketball World Cup, and has covered the NBA and high school basketball. Fran Frischilla coached at the collegiate level for 23 years, posting an overall record of 175 and 100. When he joined ESPN, he ranked as the 34th winningest active coach in men's college basketball. His teams made eight postseason appearances in nine years, including three NCAA tournaments. From 1999 to 2002, Frischilla was the head coach at the University of New Mexico where he guided the Lobos to the Mountain West Conference Championship game and the third round of the NIT in 2001. Frischilla was the head coach at St. John's University from 1996 to 1998. In 98, he led the Red Storm to the NCAA tournament for the first time in five years. He was the head coach from 1992 to 1996 at Manhattan College where his teams reached the postseason all four years with two NCAA and two NIT appearances. In 95, the team won the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference Championship, and Frischilla was named Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference Coach of the Year, National Association Basketball Coaches District 2 Coach of the Year, Eastern Basketball Coach of the Year, and the Metropolitan Basketball Writers Coach of the Year. Before becoming a head coach, Frischilla worked as an assistant basketball coach for five teams, including Providence College, Ohio State University, Ohio University, University of Rhode Island, and New York Tech. Our brand new website, www.hoopheadspod.com, is now up and running. When you visit the site, you can listen to every episode we've ever recorded. Check out our brand new Hoopheads blog, or subscribe to the official Hoopheads podcast newsletter. After you visit hoopheadspod.com, head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and review. Those ratings help the show find more people and help us grow the game. Please take some notes as you learn more about the basketball journey of ESPN's Fran Frischilla. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast from ESPN, Fran Frischilla. Fran, welcome. My pleasure, Mike. Anybody who's got a podcast named Hoop Heads, I'm all in on that because that's essentially <laughs> what I've been my whole life. So I'm looking forward to talking to you guys. Yeah, we appreciate that. So we want to start out, Fran, by talking about you as a kid and how you got into the game of basketball and what made you fall in love with it. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, which, you know, in in some ways, uh, you know, when I was growing up, when you said the city game, you often thought about New York City and all the great playground legends. And uh, believe it or not, when I was growing up, the New York Knicks were winning world championships. That's how long ago it was. Um, and pre, I pre, pre, pre James Dolan. They, they yeah, weren't trading way, their best player before, away in the middle of the season. Yeah, way before James Dolan and these knuckleheads trading Porzingis. That's another story. But uh, isn't that crazy? I, yeah. I mean, that's that's a good segue. But what are they? What are they doing? 
I well, mean, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe yeah. They may they may be thinking they're going to get KD and Anthony Yeah, they Davis may know something maybe... that the rest of us don't, right? But Exactly. Wow. And, and, and a trade like that is usually going to be good for both teams. That's why you make it. You know, you got two bright front offices. But I live here in Dallas now. So although I'm a New York Nick, I mean, to have Porzingis and Doncic together with uh, wow. it's incredible. With Carlisle. Uh, they, and, listen, uh, they need Gasola. They don't have a whole, like, the whole uh, Euro team together over there. Could be. Could be. I mean, if anybody can do it, you know, that might mean Dirk might come back for another year. Which would, Yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. They, I don't know if Dirk can really make it up to 482 games, but uh, he still had a great career. But anyway, growing up in New York, I was a hoop fan. And uh, I was one of those kids like a lot of guys. Uh, a lot of, Maybe you guys were the same way, but I played baseball in the summer, football in the fall, basketball in the winter. And, you know, when I was 12 or 13, I was a much, well, I was a good basketball player, but I was a really good baseball player, played on all sorts of little league, all-star teams, uh, almost made it, you know, deep into that little league, uh, East regional uh, when I was a kid. And, uh, so I was better at baseball, but I got hooked on basketball when I was 12 or 13 and I began to live in the gym and live in the parks of Brooklyn. And, you know, I was one of those guys that I literally played five, six hours a day. I really did. I wasn't tall. Uh, I was always the scrappiest guy in the neighborhood, but I knew right then and there when I was about 12, 13, 14, that I wanted to be a college basketball coach. I I had a realistic idea of my physical gifts. So I knew I wasn't going to get very far with basketball. Um, but I, I, I knew right then and there I wanted to coach and, um, it, it, it really started, with a love of the game that began because of what basketball means to, you know, kids who grew up in New York city. So if you think about your upbringing in the game and playing outside on the playground and playing yes. a lot of pickup basketball compared to the system that kids grow up in today, yeah. how would you a compare that? And if you had to go back and relive your childhood under the current system, how would you feel yeah. about it? I know how I would feel about it, but I'm curious to get your take on that. I was I was blessed, Mike. I really was because, um, you know, and I've talked to many people about this and you, you hate to I hate to be the old guy, you know, like get off my lawn guy. But when I was growing up in, in Brooklyn and I've had this conversation with many people and you may have even experienced this when you were growing up in northeast Ohio. But we learned to play on the schoolyards against the older guys. Sometimes it was the guys that were away at college playing It was a really good high school players when I was 13 or 14 or 15 and started to get better. I was getting better because I would practice all morning and afternoon in the park by myself, figuring things out on my own, working on my left hand, working on, you know, working on, uh, believe it or not, even floaters back then, you know, Uh, things that I needed to be able to compete at night with the older guys when they came home from work or, or in the summertime when the when the, you know, when the, when the kids came back from college. So it was kind of the law of the jungle, survival of the fittest. And, you know, you might not get on the court for a few games. You might not even get on the court, you know, uh, cer- certain nights. Uh, but there would always be a night where they had nine guys and they'd say, hey, uh, take, the, take the young guy, you know, uh, take Fran. He moves the ball well. He plays hard, you know. And so I learned how to play with, like many uh, guys did with, with older players, knew my role, knew that the only way to be able to stay on the court was to gain their trust. I get my butt kicked. I figure out what I could have done better. I come back to the park the next day and work on those things. And, you know, gradually, um, I kept improving and, uh, I played high school basketball in Brooklyn, played against some guys that went on to NBA careers like Rolando Blackman, Vinnie Johnson, Albert King, uh, guys like that. Um, I could have played at the Division Three school, Brooklyn College, where I went. I was good enough. Um, it's it's ironic on the schoolyards. I, I wasn't uh, wasn't really friendly with the guy that was the coach of Brooklyn College. At the same time, I had a chance to go back to my old high school as a freshman in college and coach the JV team, and that's what I did. I started my coaching career as a college freshman, and the rest is history. That's probably a, a pretty unusual opportunity that you were afforded to be able to coach when you're still in school. So what, is, what was it that you loved about coaching? What was the thing that just grabbed you and said, this is something that I really want to do and pursue as my career at such a young age? Well, I was always the guy on the, on the, on the team, whether it was baseball or basketball or even Pop Warner football. 
I was always the kind of the coach on the floor, the coach on the field. You know, I was the guy that called all the signals in the infield. I, I was the Pop Warner quarterback, even though I was a little guy. So I love being in charge, and I love telling guys what to do, where to go, how to improve. And it was really, I think, a product of probably being the shortest guy in the neighborhood, oftentimes one of the whitest kids in the neighborhood, and always trying to overachieve. And I think because I was an overachiever, and believe it or not, when I got to when I got to college and I, I was still playing schoolyard ball, I mean, I grew up in the parks of Brooklyn. And, you know, when I was 18, there was a kid that in our neighborhood that was kind of like me, but he was – you know, he was older, uh, excuse me, he was bigger, but younger. We always want to try to get him on our team. Um, his name was Chris Mullen, you know, and so. Why like, would you want Chris Mullen on your team, Fran? Come on, I don't know. Right. I, I, don't understand. Saying, I don't understand. He, you know what? He was only 6'3 <laughs> at the time. That's the crazy thing. But he was 14 years old. And uh, and, and so that's, you know, I kept get, I kept improving even as a schoolyard player. And, and, it, I, and I'm still, I got to tell you, I'm still legendary down at Ohio U at Grover Center in those pickup games because, by the time I even left college, I was I, by that time I became a really good playground player. But, but anyway, my point was because of who I was, how I was built, my DNA, my you know physical attributes, I always had to be a little tougher, a little smarter, a little you know more insightful to my teammates. Um, I was really a coach on the floor from the youngest age possible, and it was the way that I felt I can continue with this love of the game was was coaching, and so. Um, whether it was coaching at JV, whether it was starting to work at summer basketball camps around the country, um, that's what I did. And, you know, and I'll tell you one quick story. Um, 1978, I'm a college sophomore. That's a long time ago, guys. And I go to Dean Smith's basketball camp at North Carolina, and I was thrilled. You know, I was going to be working at Dean Smith's camp. I felt like I'd made it big. We had a suite for all the coaches in the dorm, and my suite mate was this loud, talking, brash guy from Pittsburgh who was also a college sophomore, some guy named Calipari. You know, I don't know whatever happened to him, but, <laughs> but I mean, that's how far back in the game I go. I mean, I, I came up, you know, wanting to coach. Uh, we became good friends there at camp and obviously ever since. So it's been in my blood. I mean, that's the best way to say it. I know it's a long-winded way of telling you, but it's in my blood daily daily from the time i was about 12 years old to now what do you remember about that first year coaching the jvs in terms of how you would compare your evolution as a coach where you got to at the point of your career what what, when you look back on that first year what are some of the things you're like man i had no idea what i was doing You, you you couldn't have said it any better um you know when we were growing up bob knight was our hero in coaching you know motion offense hard-nosed, tough defense. Indiana was just becoming a national power. Obviously, they went on and won, I think, three titles. Um, And my first week of practice as the JV coach, we were going to do charge drills and diving on the floor for loose balls uh, because that's what I'd read that Coach Knight did. Um, Very first week of practice, we do a loose ball drill, guys diving on the floor. It's all out mayhem. And one of my best players broke his ankle diving on the floor and I was <laughs> like oh man yeah I was like okay I love toughness and I did coach toughness eventually when I became a college coach but this is probably not good for my career if I keep doing these drills and guys are getting hurt all the time you know I feel terrible about it now but uh you know you learn to adjust and you learn to figure out what works what doesn't you learn how to teach the game better you learn what makes what motivates young players, um, you know, you learn to be demanding, but, but humane. And, um, so I can think of, I can think back to those days. I remember also about having a great pattern offense back then we ran a great pattern offense, but we never, we didn't know when to take a shot because there was no <laughs> shot pattern, pattern, right? So the pattern was great, but my guys didn't know when to shoot or not. And so you, those are the kind of things you learn when you just get into the coaching. And of course I was 19 or 20 and, uh, you know, the stuff on paper looked great, but uh, I, I definitely did evolve as a coach. So through that evolution, who were some of your mentors in the coaching profession early on? Well, good question. Uh, you know, I, 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 re- I read everything. I watched games on TV. Um, but I would say, you know, my, early, my, earliest, my earliest mentors, first of all, the, the guy that got me to be a coach was my Little League baseball coach. 
as I, I, I can remember coaching at Manhattan College as a head coach. And it and I, I thought I was driving home one night. We had a really good team. And I was I was thinking, like, boy, I got a cool job. And it hit me that the reason I love what I was doing is because my Little League baseball coach was a great coach, great teacher and made the game fun. And and so I don't think of him very often, but that's the first mentor I really had as like a, a, a 10, 11 and 12 year old Little League baseball player. But I would say once I got to uh, to the point where I knew I wanted to be a college coach, the first guy to really take a chance on me was Danny Knee who was the head coach at Ohio University. Uh, we had met um, when I was working summer camps and he was at Notre Dame. And uh, I got to know a guy named Billy Hahn, who um, was his assistant at Ohio U. Um, those two guys really changed my life. They brought me out to Ohio from New York City. And and Danny was an ex-Marine. And, and uh, I don't have to tell you, Mike, how competitive the MAC is uh, even today and was back then. But um, I learned a lot about toughness. I learned a lot about accountability. I always tell people he fired me five times, but luckily he hired me six. <laughs> I, was, I, I was I was never fired for more than 24 hours, but when you're 24 or 25, you think you have all the answers. So Danny was really my first mentor, um, and he really um, he, there was no excuses with him and. Uh, you know, he really made me accountable to what the job entailed. He made me do, he made me run the summer camp. He made me uh, handle the recruiting. We switched on and off. Um, I coached his own defenses at Ohio U. I, I did speaking engagements in the dorms and around town. When I look back on it, even as a 23 or 24 year old, he was teaching me how to be, the, how, how to be a head coach. Um, some, some coaches put their assistants in little boxes. You're the recruiter. You're the defensive coach. You you run the camp. With Danny, it was about doing everything and learning how to do everything because what he was doing without telling you was he was preparing you to be a head coach. So he was my first mentor. We had great success at Ohio U. Uh, gosh, we went to postseason in four or five of the six years I was with him. Uh, that led me to be able to go on to Ohio State where I met Rick Barnes later followed him to Providence. And then I became a head coach at, you know, 33 years old at Manhattan College. So I think a lot of my career and success goes back to my, my years at Ohio U with Danny Nee. What was the biggest adjustment when you went from an assistant job to taking over the head job? Because obviously you had spent a number of years as an assistant and now suddenly yep. you're taking over your own program. So what did you find to be the biggest adjustment you had to make when you took over at Manhattan after leaving well, and being an assistant. Yeah. Well, it's the old joke, right? you you know, when you're assistant coach, you make suggestions. And when you're a head coach, you fun, you finally get to make decisions. And, um, you know, I, I was one of those guys that was confident. I thought I had a plan. I had worked for three great coaches. Think about this, Danny knee, Gary Williams, and Rick Barnes. Those were my three division one mentors. And what I did was I was fortunate. I, I took all the things from each of them that I liked that would fit my system, at least the system as I saw it. And I discarded some of the things I, I didn't think fit my system. And uh, I was very fortunate in my first year as a head coach because I inherited a team that had won the year before. Their head coach, Steve Lapis, went on to Villanova. I was able to replace him. And although I came in with my own style, um, one of the things I did, I thought, which was pretty smart looking back for someone with no head coaching experience was I kept a lot of the things that were working for Manhattan College the same. If it was something I didn't feel strongly about changing and the kids were comfortable with it, I kept it the same because they had won 23 games the year before. Um, so that that was something I thought that I was fortunate enough to recognize to do and not come in and say, we're changing everything. I had really smart players. Um, I made adjustments to what I thought they would feel comfortable with. But as the year went on, it gradually became my team. So while I was open-minded to keeping things the same, slowly but surely, we implemented all the things that I felt were important to me. And I, was, I always joke with my former players on that first team, because we did go to the NCAA tournament in my rookie year that I didn't really start to learn how to coach until the fourth or fifth game of that season. They actually coached the team for me. 
without, <laughs> you know, like I, I ran the offense and defense. I called the plays out, but you know, they would come to me and say, uh, I'd say, what do you think here guys? Hey coach, let's get the ball inside to, to big bull, our, our best player, Keith Bullock. So I w- I think what was really fortunate, it was that I had the self-awareness to be open-minded and not come in as a dictator and say, this is how we're doing it. And, and, uh, you know, I was fortunate to have kids who were already coachable, had already been screamed at by Steve Lapis, who was pretty good at it as, as was I, and uh, my guys adjusted well to a first year head coach. Yeah, I think it is a, you know, you look back and we've talked to a bunch of different coaches at, at every level for the, for the show. And one of the things we found is that, to a man, almost everybody says that, you know, you come in in that first year and you kind of have your ideas of what you want to do and how you want to set up your program, what you want to establish. And, you know, as you come in, you, you realize that as you go through that there are things and adjustments that you have to make and things that you thought were, oh, this is what I'm going to do. And then right. turns out that you just have to make those adjustments on the fly, whether it's to your kids or just the situation or the program. And eventually you find what works for you can you talk a little bit about forget about the x's and o piece of it can you talk about how you went about building a culture within all of the programs that you were the head coach for and and how how you went about establishing what you were trying to do from a culture standpoint yeah you know what i've always been very fortunate um i i'm an attention to detail guy and my my philosophy uh, you know i had a number of different philosophies that i think really worked well Number one, I always tried to I always tried to create a practice environment that was more physically and taxing than the game, you know. And it's not just the fact that we're going to have long practices because I didn't believe that either. I thought, like, I, I, in my years as a head coach, uh, I honestly, guys, I never ran a suicide after practice. We never did. I felt like it was an insult to me as a coach if I couldn't create a practice whether it was two and a half hours in October or an hour in February where we didn't go so hard that we got everything we, we had to get done uh, from, let's just say from a conditioning standpoint within the practice environment. So I always created intense practices. Um, They were also mentally taxing. I made guys think outside the box constantly created drills that were more difficult than the actual game, whether it was playing five on seven against pressure or changing ends of the floor on a command in a in a shell drill. I constantly worked to get the practice at a frenzy um, to where they were constantly reacting and thinking, uh, and it became second nature to them. So that was the first thing, I think, was being able to overload practices so that the games would become easy. I think the second thing I did well, uh, you know, is, is that um, I set a standard uh, that was intense. Um, I was one of those guys. One of the things we did, for example, in the preseason, we actually did a, a something we call 2020s, which was 20 uh, suicides. I hate to call them suicides, but 20 suicides in 20 minutes. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, but it's it's you know you got to be back in a certain amount of time. You got to complete yep. the run in 30 seconds, right? Yep. And yep. Get, yep. And you, you got get the rest of that minute. Get yeah, whatever's get, le- get whatever's left to rest. We call, Thanks, we call absolutely. It, I coach middle school basketball. We call it four minutes of pleasure. I don't know if that's yeah, what they say. Yeah. That's what they call it. Well, here's what we did. Like everybody in my program knew that if you missed a line during 2020s, that we would go back. And I put the 20 minutes on the clock, and you know we'd count them down, and you know it was it was pretty rigorous. And invariably, every year a freshman who had been told <laughs> by the coaches and his teammates not to miss the lines would miss a line. And if it was, if there were three minutes on the clock and they had just run 17 suicides, I would say, or someone would yell out the assistant coaches, coach, Mike missed the line. And I would stop, to, stop the running. We put 20 minutes back on the clock. I give him a little bit of time to recover, but we go back and do the 20 all over again. And so, and I did that with everything we did in practice. I wanted them to understand that every little thing we do had to be done with an attention to detail that would cause us to win games that we might not, you know, normally were supposed to win, that we were going to do everything to us as close to perfection as possible, even though we were coaching and playing an imperfect game. So I, I was a stickler for those kind of things. 
Um, so when you add this high standard to the idea that we created chaos and practice, those were two things particularly that worked for me. Um, I think another thing that I did was create an environment where the players had ownership. And I hope I'm not rambling. Am I rambling here? No, you are not rambling. No, we love the stories. Keep it going. Okay. So here's the greatest thing that ever happened in my coaching career. And I was really fortunate, guys. Uh, you know, I, I, I had eight postseason teams in nine years. We beat Arizona when I was at New Mexico when they were number two in the country, broke a 60-game winning streak. When I was at St. John's, we, we broke a 60-game winning streak up at UConn. At Manhattan, we were able to knock off a four-seed Oklahoma when we were 13-seed. None of those things are as, as fulfilling as one day in practice um, at Manhattan College. I had a team that was 19 and three. It was the middle of February, and you know, you guys know how the dog days are. And I and we were practicing on a Wednesday. We weren't playing until a Saturday. We were the best team in the league by far. And I said to my coaching staff, "Get ready, because I'm going to throw the guys out of practice after five minutes today. <laughs> I I want them to think that I'm unhappy, but I really am just giving them a day off. And so five minutes in. Somebody throws the ball away. I, I put on this great act and go ballistic, which I did on occasion. So it was realistic. They thought I was really mad. And I just said, you know, I can't repeat the language, but I basically said, hey, you guys think you're better than you are. You're 19 and three. You think you got this made. You know, uh, I don't want to see you guys until tomorrow. So I kick them out of practice five minutes in. I go up to my office. Assistant coaches come up with me and they're laughing and joking. Coach, that was great. You had us believing that you were really, you know, really mad. Well, five minutes go by and one of the managers comes up and says, Coach, um, they're still practicing. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, the, the guys just took the practice plan and they're practicing. So my assistant coach has said, should we go down there? And I said, no, it's not our team anymore. It's their team. They thought that I was upset with them and that they had let me down. And they kept practicing. And that's as I think back on that time and I explain to when we have these reunions and I tell the guys about that, that day in practice, um, I get emotional about it because they believe so much in how we practiced every day that they did not want to leave that gym. And because they were so accountable to each other to have this great team, which we ended up winning 25 games. I think we were 25 and five beat Oklahoma, should have beaten Arizona State. But that day at practice was the greatest moment of my coaching career because um, I got a group of kids who really understood what it meant to be a great practice team. How long until they knew that you were, weren't serious about them making you upset? Or did you never really tell them until like... About 10 years later, Mike. Yeah, I, could, I was going to say, I could have answered that for Jason. <laughs> I could I could easily oh, answer that. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> long, I, long Jason, time after. Yeah, Jason Osley, 10 years later, man, because I didn't want to tell them. And we laugh about it now, but um, it's how they felt about practice. Because when when we had practice, when I had practices, they were always open to coaches. Uh, and in New York City, we had great high school coaches. And when, when high school coaches showed up at our practices, my guys were like trained SEALs. They, 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 they wanted to put on a show because they took so much pride in how hard we practiced every day. And um, it's, I still get emotional when I think about that day that I kicked them out and they kept practicing. Yeah, there's no better testament to a coach's culture than that story right there. Uh, because, again, I know that, you know, it's a cliche, but they always say that, you know, player led teams are are far more successful than coach led teams. And I think that story Com illustrates yeah. it perfectly. Um, you know, the fact and that I don't know how you ownership. Yeah, and I don't know how you were as a player, but like when we go on a road trip, I would just say, you know, uh, you know, like you might say to me, coach, hey, the guys want to know if we can go to uh, when we go to Ypsilanti, can we go to that TGI Fridays? We're getting tired of Chili's. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. and I and, and, and I might say, Mike, that's fine. No problem. You know, you just better put your ass off tomorrow night. <laughs> don't mess and, up. Well, we all, we were all we were we were we were Bill Knapps. Yeah, and Mount, Bill Knapps. And Jet and. And Mountain Jacks, that was our two places when I was at Kent. Those are the Let two places that Coach McDonald loved to stop at. So, oh, Bill Knapps, I'm telling you, the greatest like uh, chocolate fudge cake with vanilla ice cream, you know. 
Honey and biscuits. Um, honey and biscuits. Yeah, they honey had and biscuits. Yes. I mean, I'm a yep. Bob. I'm still a Bob Evans guy to this day. You know, when there I'm you go. when I'm in the Midwest. But truthfully, you know, I wanted my guys. I didn't really. I don't really care what, what. I didn't care about making decisions about the little things. You know, like a little thing about where we ate the night before. Uh, you know, there's nothing better, as you know. And the, some of the greatest moments of my career were at, in the Mac and in the and in both Macs. Where you're on a four-hour bus ride and and you know you're you're at a restaurant and you're goofing around and hanging out with the players and joking and laughing and so I let those guys make decisions on all the small things that I didn't think were important to me, but may have been important to my team, and and I think that's another way you build that player-led you know culture. Yeah, I think that's a huge point. You know, one of the things that sometimes and I notice this even with my own kids, I have a ninth grade daughter and a seventh grade son and then a third grade daughter. And there's some things that you forget what's important to them at those ages, yeah. like yep. getting their uniform and picking out their number where now you're kind of like, hey, eh, you know, who cares what number you get? And, <laughs> you know, my kids thinking about it for weeks up until, you know, I got I to make sure I get number 13 because I got to get to the box because I know there's another yeah. kid who wants that number. And you forget that those little things that you as an adult or you as a coach don't care that much about, it's not that important to you. But to kids, yes. those things make a huge difference. And I think just by allowing kids to choose what restaurant you eat at, you know, while you're on a road trip, that goes a hey, long way towards building yeah. that team camaraderie for sure. And, and what about gear? What about when they show up at practice one day and there's new sweatsuits in their lockers? You know what yeah, I mean? Absolutely. So oh. stuff like that, little things like stuff, you know, like my managers might say, coach, the new, the, the new champion, you know, hooded, hooded sweatshirts came in. Uh, you want to give them out now? I go, no, hold on to them. We'll put them, let's put them in their bags for the road trip. You know what I mean? And kids get to the gym and they're getting ready to leave for, you know, Western Michigan or Toledo. And all of a sudden you see brand new gear in your, in your, in your travel bag. You know, that's the kind of things I think, you know, these little things that make the, you want the players to just know that you appreciate the effort they're giving you. And um, I do think it goes a long way when you, when you do those little things. Yeah. Those experiences are really what it's all about. I mean, we all, you know, you get an opportunity to play in great venues and you, you get an opportunity to, to compete day in and day out. But I think a lot of times it's those little things. And that's really what you remember. People ask me all the time about games I played in and, you know, they'll ask me, I'll have guys that I went to school with and they'll say, Hey, what about that? You know, that OU game when you were a sophomore. And a lot of times I'm like, <laughs> look, I played, look, I played, I played OU, you know, 10 times over the course of my career. So some of those games run together, except for the game Jamerson yeah. scored 52 on me. But um, uh, you know, I recruited Dave. You know that? I recruited Dave. I believe he was uh, – yeah. I've never seen probably – of any guy I've ever been on the floor with in an actual yes. game, Yes. there's nobody who shot the ball as quickly and was as difficult to guard. And, like, again, he had 52, and I swear I was – not more than six inches away from him at any point during that entire game. Um, so yeah, he, you know, was, Mike, he was phenomenal. I, he might've been the greatest shooter I've ever, I, I'll tell you, I, I know it's, it's sacrilegious to say greatest shooter ever I've ever been, but I know this easily the greatest shooter I've ever been around. I mean, and, and I'll tell you, we were fortunate at Ohio U to, you know, we stole him out of Stowe, Ohio and Bob Huggins was at Akron. They wanted him to walk on and, and he went to five star and he was a senior, but they listed him on the roster as a junior. And he and I got really close. And, um, you know, to this day, I can't, I just, you know, I, I, you know, you, you said it to 52, 30 points as a senior, but, uh, the ultimate gym rat, you know, the ultimate gym rat with a photographic memory. And even today, if you said, you know, what'd you do against Cuyahoga Falls your sophomore year? He'd say, well, I had 29, but the thing I remember most is I went 18 for 19 from the line, and I missed one. I missed the 19th <laughs> free throw. I mean, that's yep. the kind of yep. brain that guy had. So, yeah, no, I mean, that's the fun part of uh, coaching is being around, being around, you know, guys like you get, that, you know, just love the game. And you, as a coach, I love talking about the game with guys like Jamerson because he was such a junkie. Yeah, it's a shame that he hurt his knee. I mean, it, it, you look back and – you know, I mean, yeah. I think he was, I think he was the 14th pick overall in the league and, you know, just, I mean, yep. I he made it through his rookie, rookie career, rookie contract and that was it. Right. But he was yep. just, I think if he hadn't have gotten hurt both, you know, I know he got, I know he got hurt when he was at OU and then he hurt his knee when he yeah. got to the NBA. And I just yep. think he was so strong and he was so quick and he was so physical. And again, like I said, of all the guys that I played against in college, 
he was by far the most difficult cover that I ever had. So he, he was, well, he was, was something special. I was with him in Belgium on our foreign tour when he tore his knee up before his, uh, probably would have been his junior year, you know, and, uh, I flew back to the States with him, um, and let the team stay in Europe because Dave had to get back and we had to take care of the knee. So you bring him back, you know, incredible memories, by the way. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's fun. It's funny how just, again, all that stuff, when you look back and it's hard to believe for me, you know, it's almost 30 years ago that I walked out of the yeah. campus at Kent and, you know, <laughs> you, you look back at all that time in the game and just the, the experiences that the game of basketball has obviously given you and given me yeah. and then having the opportunity to, you know, we were starting the, starting the podcast like we did in June and then having this opportunity to talk to so many people who love the game of basketball has just been, it's been super energizing for me to be able to have these kinds of conversations because it's just so much fun to, to talk hoops. Yeah, but you're making me relive some great times, too, as, as you know, the people who are listening, you know, are now figuring out, like, I was a Brooklyn guy who spent eight incredible years in Ohio, so uh, I drove around that state. I mean, I knew the shortcut from Youngstown uh, <laughs> didn't, down to Canton and then over to 77 where I headed south. Uh, I used to plan my recruiting trips to Northeast Ohio based on which Bob Evans I was stopping off on, 71 nice. or nice. 77, so... You yep. know, that's, that's the way I, that's, that's how my brain thought back then. That's it. Understood. <laughs> Registration is now open at www.headstartbasketball.com for this summer's Head Start Basketball Camps. We'll be hosting camps this summer at Strongsville, Westlake, Avon Lake, Oberlin, Brunswick, Highland Heights, Mentor, and Hudson. At Head Start Basketball, we care deeply about making a positive impact on the lives of young basketball players, both on and off the court. It's through building strong relationships with our players, parents, and coaching staff that we are able to use the game of basketball to enrich the lives of those we interact with, both inside and outside of our organization. We believe that our attention to detail, our growth mindset, and our commitment to lifelong learning allows us to help our players achieve their fullest potential. We are passionately committed to providing players, parents, and coaches with everything they need to reach their goals. These core values run through everything we do, Check out our website, www.headstartbasketball.com, and discover why you should attend a Head Start basketball camp this summer. Hope to see you there. So if you think back to your college time, what was your biggest challenge as a head coach? What was the thing that always you felt like you really had to work at or something that really pushed you to, to be at your best? Well, I think there's a couple things. I think as a young coach, I was way too intense. And, um, and, and I think that as I look back, you know, like I had one player who I coached at St. John's and in Hamilton and who, who was an, a McDonald's all American. I inherited him and Felipe Lopez. You remember, you know, you guys remember those yep. names. Mm -hmm. And when I got to St. John's, they were juniors coming into their junior year. They had no success. Unfortunately, the coach was a good guy. Uh, but I, I came in and, and really, again, talk about changing the culture, accountability. And uh, I was really tough on guys. And I remember um, and we got and we got back to the NCAA tournament. You know, we did. And we, I had coach Ron Artest and he was one of my recruits at St. John's. And I left I left a good program behind. But I remember about three or four years ago, you know, Zenden's now coaching in the G League uh, for the Clippers. And, and he and I were out in Las Vegas at the summer league. And um, I said, Z, you know, I owe you an apology, man. I said, I was way too tough on you. He goes, coach, you're the reason I drive a Range Rover. And I said, because, <laughs> you know, because he'd made he'd made a, you know, even though he had a, an average NBA career, he played 12 years, played overseas. Yep. And he goes, don't, he goes, don't apologize. He goes, I was young. I was immature. You had to get on me. And, and that's kind of a cool story, but it also is indicative of the fact that, you know, I just, I, I told you how intense I was and I just didn't take no for an answer. I mean, you know, I was the guy that recruited Ron Artest and, you know, I was crazier than him, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he had this reputation of being volatile. And of course, everybody remembers Malice at the palace right. and he's an incredible human being. He really is. And he's doing great, but I had to be crazier than him because he was crazy. <laughs> and so I, I had, I, you know, I had to be intense every single day. And so as I look back on it and I've got two sons and we'll talk about them later because they're both coaching now. I've told them both. I said, you cannot 
you can be intense and demanding, but you have to, you have to come from a, 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 a place of, of love and caring. They have to know you love them. You know, Tom Izzo, Bill Self, uh, maybe John Beeline to an extent. These guys are high intensity guys. But I don't think there's any question that those kids believe in them. They'll do anything for them. And even the days where Tom Izzo has to get on one of his guys, those kids know it comes from a, a, a position of love. Um, tough love, maybe, but love nevertheless. And I think that's a really important thing that I learned as my career went on. And I wish I had known that sooner. And um, the other thing I learned, and I learned this at New Mexico, which was my final stop before I went to TV because I thought I would uh, leave New Mexico, co do TV a couple of years, and then go back to coaching, is um, I inherited kids, quite frankly, that you know were not great kids character-wise. And I would advise any coach who's in a situation where he's recruiting or where, where, where he's putting together a high school team that you just can't compromise on character. You just can't. Um, you can be a mentor. You can teach immature kids maybe to grow up a little bit more, but they have to have a certain level of character in order to be coached and criticized because feedback's a two-way street. And if I tell you, uh, you know, uh, Mike, you got to play harder, you got to do this better, it's got to be taken with the with that sense that coach really cares about me and I know he wants me to be better, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that for him. But if you don't have that kind of character, you're going to think that the coach is the bad guy. And that, that gets to be a really dicey situation. So how do you build those relationships with kids so that they do develop that trust in you where they get to the point that you you can get on them, you can push them, you can demand from them, and they're not going to look at it as, oh, why is coach picking on me? How do you, get, how do you build that kind of relationship with your kids to, to make that happen? It's a, it's a it's a really good question. It's again a, something I learned on the fly, and um, you know I'll, I'll relate a good story to you. You know I was an intense recruiter. I mean I I loved recruiting. I loved getting to know kids, families, outworking people. If you were at the if you were at the park in Strongsville at 7 a.m. in the middle of July, I'd show up and watch you shoot around. You know what I'm talking about? The guy Absolutely. that felt the guy that felt made the, made you feel like boy this guy really wants me. And I don't know which place it was I, that I was coaching, but I remember signed signed a kid that we really loved as a player and a good kid. And, you know, like the first the first month of his career, um, I, I was all over him. And and like he was in the office shooting a breeze with one of the assistants one day. And like he said to one of the assistants who he was close to, like, what happened to that nice guy that recruited me? You know what I mean? Like what happened to that personable, joking Fran for show a guy that made me feel like I was a million bucks, you know, and, and his point was, I, I'm, I want to, I want that. I want the relationship with that guy. I, in other words, you can coach me hard, but I want to still, I still want that guy that recruited me who I, I fell in love with because he was right. always at my gym, always at my, you know, practices. My aunt and uncle loved him. You know, my little sister loved him, you know, and so that was a great lesson. And I'll never forget, uh, I had a player at Manhattan College, uh, a young man by the name of Justin Phoenix. He now works for the NBA, and he's in their like, uh, replay center in Secaucus. And I didn't recruit him, but I inherited him as an incoming freshman at Manhattan. And for two years, I screamed at him. And, I, and he's 6'8", extremely athletic, uh, really talented, wound up winning a lot of games for us. And for two years, I couldn't get him to do the things I wanted him to do. And first practice of his junior year, same thing. I'm on him, getting on him for, for, for not practicing hard. And finally, after practice, I grab him on the side. And I said to him, Justin, what do I got to do to get you to play harder? And he goes, stop yelling at me. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that. And I'm just telling you guys, for the next two years, he was an all-league player. And, you know, there were things I bit my tongue on that I wanted to yell at him at practice, but I, I learned how to live with some of his, you know, inefficiencies at times in practice, but his talent blossomed. And it's a great lesson because you just can't coach every single guy the same. You got to know what makes him tick. And it's a long winded way of answering what you asked me. Like, how do you get to, how do you get the kids to give their best for you? And it's just getting to know them and know what but buttons to push. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's one of the things that, 
if I think back to my time as a young coach, you know, you kind of come and you, you come at it from the perspective of a player and you, you kind of try to do the things that worked for you or things that you saw and you really didn't look at each one of those individual kids. At least I know I didn't. And so I think yeah. that's great. A great piece of advice is you've got to know what buttons to push. And I think all the best coaches, again, it doesn't matter what level you could talk NBA, yeah. you could talk college, you could talk high school, you could talk youth coaches, all yeah, those all great coaches. It's all, it's all right. It's all the same. It's, it's, it's yeah. a different skill level. It's a different level of physicality, yeah. but coaching is coaching. And there are some guys who are better suited to coach in the college level. And there are other guys who are better suited to coach a sixth grade team. And not because one coach is better than the other, but simply because of the way they interact with the kids at that particular level. Yeah. I think that really, you know, you learn what the kids strengths and weaknesses are. You learn what their personality is. And then to your point, yeah. you know, you, you figure out what buttons to push and then you get the best out of them. And that's really what it's all well, about. It, it is. And I'm going to tell you something from my, my experience of moving to Ohio and coaching at Ohio. U. remember Danny knee used to send me around the state, go watch open gyms. And he'd say, you know, hey, I want you to keep when you go into this gym and you watch uh, Mitch Gillum at Lorraine Admiral King, which is a school that I understand is no longer open. It's now yeah, no longer Senior, there. Yeah, it's right? like they closed. Yeah, they merged. Yep. Or Jack Reynolds at Barberton. He was a legendary coach back in the 70s and 80s. I remember Danny would say, go watch open gym, keep your mouth shut. And don't don't tell them don't let them let let them know how stupid you are. In other words, <laughs> these, these, these guys are great coaches. Like I, I, I've said this on a number of occasions. I mean, this probably five of the 10 greatest coaches I've ever been around were high school coaches. I mean that like I would travel around Ohio and Indiana and watch guys coach, put their teams together or go to a regional, which I loved. You know, in February, early March, going to like the, you know, the regional, seeing St. Joe's play, Cleveland St. Joe's at the time, now Villa Angela St. Joe's, or <clears throat> seeing Toledo St. John's, or uh, Delta St. John's, or Admiral King, Canton McKinley, and, you know, just in awe of these guys who I, I'd look at them and say, this guy could coach. And, I mean, Bill Frieder is a good coach, but he's no better X and O guy than this guy. And but those guys, for whatever reason, either they didn't know how to get to the college level or they were really comfortable coaching at the high school level. Uh, I, I saw some incredible coaching. And that's why people who are listening to this podcast who are JV coaches, high school coaches, youth league coaches, coaching, coaching. And I've seen great coaches at every level and particularly at the high school level. Yeah, we talked to John Shulman on the podcast and he said something that I thought was tremendous and he said you know you just you just have to make the big time wherever you are and absolutely you know, it, it, because you know his point was you can he, when he was coaching at macaulay uh you know a private high school yep. <clears throat> sure and he said you know the biggest game of our season you know you guys have never even heard of our school and you never heard of the school they're we're playing, playing baylor they're, they're, right they're, he's they're, like you guys is baylor in exactly Chattanooga. he's like you guys could care less about that game he goes yeah. but to us it's the biggest game in the history of basketball so he said you just wherever yeah. you are yeah make it the big time and i think that's something that you know a lot of times and it depends on your personality but a lot of times there are coaches there are people that are constantly looking to the next opportunity instead of focusing on being great where you are and i think that's the key is People who do get opportunities get opportunities because they're fantastic at what they do, where they are in the moment, and then opportunities present themselves. I think people who have yeah. the one foot out the door and are already looking at the next opportunity don't always take advantage of you know of what they should and don't always do the best job in the yeah. place where they where they're at. Well, so. and I'll tell you guys this: I mean this like my my greatest four years as a college coach were my first year as a head coach at Manhattan College, and our gym held three thousand people. Um, you know, and that was, that to me was the most fun I've ever had because it was, there, there was an innocence there, you know, like it wasn't just all about being in the big time or playing in the big East or, you know, the mountain West to me, my time at Manhattan was probably akin to somebody who's got a really good high school program who loves coaching those kids year after year. And so, and that's, from that sense, I totally agree. Like wherever you are, make it the place where you, you know, like, uh, in some ways, if I could have made the same amount of money or had a, you know, bigger arena, you know, I like Mark Few, my buddy, Mark Few, you know, he don't mess with happy. And now Gonzaga is a power, but he had so many chances to leave and go to UCLA in Arizona. And 
he knows who he is, you know, I mean, I granted now they're a powerhouse, but not when he got there and sometimes just be, don't mess with happy, you know, it's always a motto that I try to live by. Yeah, absolutely. Coaching is, and coaching is coaching. Uh, absolutely. You, know, you, you can coach, whether you're at Manhattan, you're at St. John's, you're at New Mexico, you're at, you know, you're at Strongsville high school, you're at Ohio yep. university, wherever you are coaching, is coaching. And I think that that's something for everybody who's a coach out there who's listening to keep in mind that just to make yep. sure that wherever you're at, the kids are in front of you every day. Those are the kids that deserve your best. Exactly. So let's talk about after you get done coaching. Yep. And at the time, obviously, you didn't think you were done permanently, but right. you get an opportunity to go to ESPN. So talk about how that happened and then yep. sort of how your role and what you've done over the years has evolved well you know i i retired i, I retired because of illness um they got sick of me at new mexico and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no but i was you know i was 43 years old i had i'd gone out to the university of new mexico um i i averaged 20 wins a year but i i, I inherited unlike manhattan and st john's um and this is not a knock on anybody it's just a fact I inherited uh, I, the kind of group that I wasn't comfortable with. A lot of kids who didn't have the discipline that a kid playing at Manhattan or St. John's did because of the great high school coaching in New York City. And um, <clears throat> I took the job because uh, my wife was from Texas. I thought it would be a great opportunity uh, to you know, coach in the pit, which at that time was legendary. Uh, they were just forming the Mountain West. Rick Majerus was at Utah. You know, Keith Van Horn, BYU was big time in the Mountain West. Uh, Steve Fisher was going to San Diego State. So I thought it would be a really good fit. Um, but it wasn't. It really wasn't. It was, uh, you know, a lot of Juco kids, a lot of kids from tough backgrounds. So I, I had a hard time with that. I had a hard time with guys who didn't want to be coached the way I had been used to coaching. And we got through three seasons. And um I left behind a really good group of kids that uh, we wound up getting it straightened out. And I left really good kids behind who at, wound up going to the NCAA tournament a couple of years later, but uh, averaging 20 wins a year, my AD said, Hey, this is not working out. I had two years left of my contract, um, had winning seasons, um, but I was just not a good fit out there. I just wasn't. And so um, I, we moved to that, we moved to Dallas where my wife's hometown is and where I currently reside. And I've been here ever since 2002. And, um, I knew because of my time in New York that I'd get a chance with all the media people I had met, I knew I'd get a chance to go to ESPN. And I figured I'll do that for a couple of years. I'll watch my boys grow up. They were nine and six at the time, hang out with my wife's family because we had spent a lot of our time in Ohio and on the East coast with my family. And um, I got to ESPN, and after a year or two, every time a coaching opportunity would come up, usually a head coaching position back east where I was still well-known, um, I'd go to ESPN and say, look, I think I'm thinking of leaving. And I wasn't doing this to uh, negotiate a better deal, but it just turned out that way. You know, my boss said, look, we really don't want you to leave. What is it going to take? And I said, well, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to do this for money, but they just made it hard for me to leave. And to be honest with you, I was happy. I was happy watching my kids grow up. I was still around the game. I was still working at the Nike Elite Camp in the summer. Um, got to do the NBA draft. Started getting into this, all the international kids. And every time a coaching opportunity came up my first seven or eight years, I made a decision, uh, a lifestyle decision. And I, I get back. it gets back to what I said. Don't mess with happy. And um, 16, 17 years later, um, I can I, I can just tell you that when I left coaching, that was like halftime. And as I'm as I've done this now for this many years at ESPN, I feel like I'm in the second half of my career. But I'm around the game every single day. Still have a lot of the same fulfillment. Miss the teaching and the coaching. You know, miss the highs and lows of winning and losing. But I have an incredible lifestyle. And because of that lifestyle. Uh, both my sons played high school basketball in Dallas. Uh, my older guy was a walk-on at Oklahoma. Um, got a chance to be Buddy Hill's teammate for three years. He now works for the Orlando Magic after a couple of years in the G League, grinding away, making eight, nine bucks an hour. Um, he's doing video and player development for the Magic. And then my younger son, that's James, 
And my younger son, Matt, was a very good high school player in Dallas. He had a chance to go play for Tommy Amaker at Harvard, if you could believe that. Uh, took after mom for sure, <laughs> but had uh, had four wonderful years at Harvard, although he tore his ACL his junior year when he was. Um, it's really ironic how, you know, I'm, uh, as how his man upstairs works. He was recruited as a backup. Uh, the guy that was ahead of him as a sophomore when he came in was an all-conference player. Well, his name was Siani Chambers, who's playing in Europe. And Siani, uh, his senior year, Matt was a junior. Siani tore his ACL in the summer. And so now it's going to be Matt and a freshman. And Matt was playing great. But the third game into his junior year at Providence, he can always say he guarded Chris Dunn a couple possessions he was in. He's like 5'11", but <laughs> dives on the floor for a loose ball, and a kid on Providence dives on his knee, ACL, out for the year. Really never recovers to the point where he could get back in the lineup as a senior. And uh, graduated from Harvard, amazing experience being there, being, a, being with teammates, being with Tommy, being at that university. And uh, he's currently in his second year, believe it or not, at Villanova, where he's a grad assistant finishing up his MBA and working for Jay Wright. And my point is, neither one of those guys, it probably would have happened for them if I was out coaching other people's kids. And the other great thing about that thing I'm most proud of is they saw that their dad had a job that he loved. And I never told either one of them they should get into coaching. They know how hard it is. They saw me essentially resign at New Mexico and they still want to do this crazy business. And it makes me, it makes me feel great that, you know, we can have basketball conversations and, you know, Matt can, Matt can call me at 11 at night and say, Hey, did you see that play the Celtics ran at the end of the game? And that's the coolest thing that they're both doing something that uh, I, I've gotten a lifetime of fulfillment out of. So I have a question. You were, you called a lot of Oklahoma games when your son was there, correct? I did Jason. Yes. So, so yes. what was that? What was that like for you to call his well, games while you were well, <laughs> working for ESPN and he was playing? Well, luckily, he was never in a, in a he was never in a game at a point in the game where it really mattered what the fans thought, like Kansas fans. <laughs> uh, but you know, he became a cool little novelty. I mean, when I say novelty, that's that's an insult to him. I mean, uh, he ended up being a guy that was, you know, worked his butt off as a as a great practice player. And he did a lot in the community in Norman and, and so much to the point that he was actually one of the seven finalists for Big 12 male sportsman of the year as a walk on, which is an incredible, you know, accomplishment because of all the things that he was involved with at the university. So I was really proud of that. But it was really, very, really easy. What, what would happen on Twitter would be if Kansas beat Oklahoma in a game I did. Oklahoma fans would say, well, the only reason he's a, he was so pro Kansas is because he didn't want to show everybody that he's biased. To, <laughs> that he's really pro Oklahoma. Oklahoma. That's hilarious. Yeah. And then when Oklahoma, <laughs> when Buddy Heald would get 37 on Kansas and beat him in Norman, Kansas fans would say, well, he's such a homer, that guy, because his son plays on the team. So <laughs> I never, ever, I never, ever worried about it. I never, ever worried about it. It was no big deal. Um, it was fun to see him a lot. Um, it was a little hard for me at the end of some games because I had to be so neutral. Um, but I'm not going to lie. If they won and he was happy, I felt good for him. But I never really sulked when they lost because uh, he was living his own life and I was doing my thing. And the thing I had to answer to were the people in Bristol saying that, you know, I was uh, prepared for the game and he had an easy listen and, and you know, did my job well. All right. So here's what I want to ask you. And I think yep. this is something that is – totally relevant to people's basketball experience out there today. So if you had to give advice to basketball parents, yep. what's some advice that you would give to people to make sure that the experience is about the kids and not about the parents? Well, it's a great question. That was always a hard line for me to draw, uh, to, to walk when I was a parent, uh, when they were playing AAU or in high school, because, you know, I, I knew so much about the game, you know, um, and that wasn't easy. Uh, but I think that the keys are to really, I, I just think you, you play sports because it's fun. And if it's fun and you're going to enjoy it, let's say it's basketball, but it could be any sport. 
if it's fun and you enjoy it, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to love it and you're going to want to work at it. And if a parent is making it miserable for his kid and he's always constantly critiquing them and yelling at him or putting pressure on them or yelling at the coach or yelling at the referees, it becomes a very unenjoyable experience. And I think it translates down to the young man or young lady. And so I think the first thing I would suggest is create an environment where when they're young, first of all, I'm a big believer in, in, in playing multiple sports as a, as a kid, uh, whether it's baseball, football, basketball, golf, tennis, soccer, which I think is a great sport for basketball, playing soccer. I think specializing at an early age to me is not necessarily the best way to do it. Um, and so that's the first thing. My kids played, you know, three sports until they decided basketball was what they wanted to focus on. When I when I worked them out, and I never coached their AAU teams, but I did a lot of skill work with them, I had a rule. We're going to only go for an hour and 15. And we're going to go hard. We're going to do our drills. And we're going to – I'm going to make it fun, but we're going to work. And we're, I'm going to I'm going to stretch your – you know, we're going to work on things you're not good at. Um, but it was, a, it was a maximum of an hour and 15 with me. You want to stay in the gym and shoot on your own or shoot with your buddies or play pickup after that? I'll come back and pick you up. But I'm not being I'm not going to live in the gym with you for four hours because then to me, it's work and drudgery. So the best compliment I used to get from my kids was they they'd say, you know, they'd say to me, hey, dad, you want to go get some shots up? It was like their idea. And I think the way we cultivated that was I wasn't overbearing with them. We didn't overdo it time wise. And I just wanted them to have fun, enjoy it and feel like they were getting better. And whether it's you as a parent coaching your kids or putting them on a youth league team with a coach who's really fun to be around, who knows the game, who's going to teach the fundamentals, you know, I think that's the first step in creating an enjoyable environment for your young, your son or your daughter. And and if they really love it, they're going to work at it on their own. If they really work at it, they're going to get better and the experience is going to get better. But if genetics don't play, don't if genetics don't play their part, they're probably not going to be a Division One athlete because that has to that's a factor too. Yeah, absolutely. I think you you said it perfectly. I think that's one of the things that you know. Again, my kids are at the age where I see lots of different parents, and you know they have different styles and philosophies of how they go about doing things. Yes, yes. I've definitely tried to follow the the guidelines that you just set up where. You know, I mean, I've coached my kids in AAU, uh, yep. I've, I've, but I've gotten to the point where none of my kids have the same love of the game that I had. So for right. me to drag them to the gym or force them to do things, uh, I try not to go that route. I try to provide them with opportunities as opposed to, to forcing it. I think the best thing that you said was is that if they love it, they're going to start doing it on their own. And then yep. that's how you get better. And then that's how you have better experiences. And what I've seen in yep. my, you know, in my time looking at just the landscape of basketball, I see a lot of parents who are pushing their kids unnecessarily. And then either a, the kid is done playing by the time they're 12, 13, 14 years old, cause they're sick of it. Or yep. the relationship with the parent has been damaged. And to me, as much as I love the game of basketball and as good as it's been to me, uh, I'm not willing to sacrifice the relationship or with my kid or the happiness that my child has to force them to be, you know, to force them to be a basketball player. So I'm still hopeful that my light, the light's going to turn on for my kids and they're going to, you yep. know, really, really blossom. But if they don't, maybe they'll blossom as a musician or an artist or a scientist yes. or whatever. Or, or something, be, so. any, any, anything, Mike, that they're passionate about. For you sure. Know, it, it could be anything. It could be architecture. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I, I want it to be, and I learned this, you know, Bob Hurley Sr. and the Hurley boys are, are friends, and I watched Bob coach his kids, and they were great players. Obviously, Bobby was an incredible player in college, one of the greatest college point guards ever. But I saw in their relationship, it got to the point where they hated going to the gym, and they, I don't want to say they hated their dad. That would be very unfair. But, you know, my sons weren't ever going to be as good as the Hurleys, but I also didn't want them to hate me. And, you know, and now today, know exactly. you know what I mean? And today we, I, I pushed them to a limit to where they might not like me some days. And, you know, I had, a, I had those guys throw a ball at me on occasion, you know, in the gym. <laughs> and, and, and that was okay. Cause that was competitive, but uh, we have such an incredible relationship now. They're both completely different. One guy never calls me James. 
the one in Orlando and, and Matt calls me every single day and we just talk basketball. So I love them the same. They're different, but we, the, through basketball, we have this incredible relationship and now, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're starting their coaching careers and hopefully they'll be good at it in part because, you know, I made it fun. We bonded. And now as I pack it in and, you know, keep doing this TV. And when I slow down, I can't wait to go to their practices. And if they become head coaches, I'm going to love to hang around and just be the old guy, you know, and they'll go that guy. I remember that guy he used to be on TV, you know, yeah, he used to do, but, he used to do some, I know I recognize used, him from somewhere. He used to do yeah. something. And that's the cool thing. And, that, and that's why I love about basketball, man. It's been my whole, I mean, it's, it's coming full circle in this podcast, but from the time I was 12 years old to I just turned 60, you know, I feel like I'm 30. It's still, this is the real hair. You see that hair on TV. It's not, it's never been dyed. <laughs> it's the real stuff. I'm lucky like Mitt Romney, but, uh, there you go. Uh, hey, I got nothing. I got nothing left. I'm waiting for all my, I'm yeah, waiting for all my I, noticed. Fall out. I start, I started, sh- I started shaving it about probably, I don't know, eight years ago or so. And I tell people all the time, they're like, I have students at school and they'll be like, Mr. Cleansing, you're bald. And I'm like, well, I'm not really bald. I wish I was because then I wouldn't have to shave my head all the time. I just exactly. wish Mike says, he, Mike says he's been shaving his head for eight years. I don't remember a time when Mike had hair. All right. So frankly. maybe it was maybe 18 years. I've known him for that. I love it. It's been a long time. Years, so. <laughs> well, I'm blessed, man. I didn't get height. You know, I wish I had height. I, I would trade the hair for height, but uh, I, understood. I didn't get height, but I got I hair. But uh, hey, that's that's my point. I've been around this game my whole life, and uh, nothing brings me more joy than to share basketball with young coaches, players, you know, on TV. And, uh, I still feel like I'm coaching through the TV screen. So it's, uh, I've been, I've been truly blessed. And, uh, you know, uh, one last thing I, I, when I go to Starbucks in the morning, the young lady says, Mr. Fraschola, are you working today? I don't have the heart to tell her, like, I don't really have a job. I don't really work, right? Yeah, exactly. I don't really work, yep. you know? So it's really cool. Yeah. It's funny. We feel the same, like, uh, you know, doing the well, since we started this podcast, I feel like, you know, we've been putting in a lot of time. And again, I don't know that I would call it work, but we've had, we had two snow days the last two days because it's been so cold here in Cleveland. Yep. And I spent, basically spent those two days working on a website for the podcast. And uh, it, it didn't feel like work at all, even though I probably spent, I don't know, 14 hours or 16 hours of those yep. two days just banging that out. So it's like, to your exactly. point, when you're doing something, when you're doing something you love, uh, it, it's not, uh, it doesn't feel like work. So I want to wrap up. Uh, Fran, by asking you about uh, a player that I have uh, a significant interest in hoping comes to Cleveland this this next season. Uh, just Can you give us a little scouting yep. report on Zion and just talk a little bit about what kind of a college player he is and who, obviously, it's hard to compare him to anybody because yeah. of his sheer yeah. physical size. But can you just talk a little bit about uh, what he is as a college player and what your thoughts are for him as an NBA prospect? Well, when I first really saw him this summer, uh, I'd seen him in high school when he was younger, but I really didn't see him on the circuit when he was a junior and senior. But when I was up, uh, I was watching uh, Duke on their summer tour of Canada. It was on ESPN Plus. So I was watching it on my computer. And I I know the level of play up in Canada. You know, the best teams are like low to mid-major teams at best. Um, And they were playing uh, Ryerson. I think they were playing Ottawa maybe university of Toronto, those are like low major teams. And I mean, he just completely captivated me. He was by far the best player on the floor, a a ridiculously freak athlete. As we've all seen, I was impressed, more impressed with how much more skilled than I thought he would be. And I said, right then and there, I told people, I probably tweeted it out. I know I did. He's the number one pick. I mean, there's nobody like him in college. And, and, uh, I think he's going to have a great NBA career. I mean, you know, he's not the same. Everybody's trying to compare him. Is he Barkley? Is he this guy, Larry Johnson? The best way I could describe him is much like Shaq captivated us um, when you guys were, you know, young. First time I saw Shaq, like, I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe a guy this big is this strong and this agile, et cetera. Zion's not the same kind of player as far as being seven foot one but he's got that same take your breath away athleticism and his skill level is tremendous and what i love about him is he plays with joy you know he plays with a smile on his face and i've told i've said this i've been quoted as saying this and it's been in the magazines and on the internet he's going to make a billion dollars playing basketball because he's not only going to be a terrific nba player but he's got this magnetism 
uh, Q factor, whatever you call it. You know, he's going to, I don't know. I don't know when uh, space jam two's coming out. I think it's coming out this summer, but seven, eight, nine years from now, he's going to do space jam three. Cause he's all, he's larger than life. And, um, I think he's going to be a great pro. The game, the NBA game is going to come even easier to him because the spacing on the floor is better. Cause he's going to be surrounded by great players. And, um, the, the floor is going to open up for his ridiculous athleticism. And I don't know if he's a point center, a forward, a guard. I don't know what he is, but he's going to be a very good NBA player, especially because of his versatility in a game that's now become a very versatile game. I was going to say, you know, there, does he really need a position in this day and age no. in the NBA? He doesn't because pretty much every single player can play every single position, essentially. I mean, you look at like yes. what LeBron does. LeBron, LeBron, his, he's famous for his uh, – when he would – with the Cavs, they would say like – where you were from and and what position he played, he would say all positions. <laughs> like he would, yeah. Like so, I mean, I, I don't think he needs a position defined. For no, him. you're right. He can he's, just be himself. And, well, and the way the NBA is now, unlike the way a lot of us grew up with two guards, two two forwards, a center, small forward, power forward, it's just a completely game, a different game. And I know we use the term positionless, but you know it really is that way. And uh, and and he is the modern positionless you know, freakazoid and, and much like LeBron transcended or, or really changed the game with his unique athleticism and skills. And you guys saw it more close up than most because of where you're located. I mean, Zion may not be the ball handler that LeBron is, but um, I got to tell you, uh, it's crazy to say this, but I think Zion is every bit as good as LeBron was when LeBron was in high school. And um, I, I'm not saying he's going to be LeBron or be one of the three greatest players ever, which I think LeBron fits into that category. But uh, I think Zion's going to be a tremendous NBA player and make a lot of money. And hopefully he won't get jaded and he'll keep the smile on his face. And we'll love watching him play because of the way he uh, he plays with zest. I agree. I've been, I've been stumping for him since the first time. I mean, I've obviously I've seen the the Twitter highlights and the, you know, the internet sensation dunks and all that stuff when he was in high school. But the first time I saw him play, and again, I saw some of those same games that you saw when he played against, uh, you know, on that Canadian tour. And I just came away from that going, this guy is just, I mean, from an athletic standpoint, I don't know that there's, you know, I don't know that there's been anybody like him at that size. And then I think it's been a revelation just how skilled he is and how unselfish he plays. And there's just so many things about him that there is to love. So uh, whenever the night of the NBA draft lottery is, I will be watching with bated breath. I still remember where I remember exactly where I was the day the Cavs won the LeBron lottery. And uh, if if by some stroke of luck, the Cavs. Uh, can win the uh, can win this lottery. I will. I'm sure remember where I was on the day that that happened. I, as well. I was in Washington D.C. both times we won the lottery. All right. Well, so gonna, I guess well, I'm going gonna, gonna to buy a Jason a get... one-way ticket to Washington D.C. Exactly. If they if they win the lottery, I'll bring them back. If not, I might just keep them there. <laughs> I got it. That's good. Good. That's probably good strategy right there. And, uh, if I were Jason, I would uh, make sure I was in D.C. Yeah, let's in, do it in, in mid-May. That'd be a lot of fun. Absolutely. All right, Fran, before we get out of here, if you wouldn't mind just sharing out how people can reach out to you, connect with you, and then if there's anything else that we didn't hit on tonight that you want to share before we get off the show, uh, that would be great. Well, no, I, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking basketball with you guys. I mean, that. it's been a lot of fun. And Mike, you and I, in a strange way, had that little kinship because of you, your For time sure. in high school and you know going to Kent State and Coach McDonald. Uh, we had great games with him when I was at, uh, Ohio U and, uh, but, uh, so that's been fun. And Jason, same here, you know, it's great to have your input. Um, but you know, at Fran for you know, I'm very, as you guys know, I'm very active on Twitter. You know, uh, my boys got me started years ago. I, I'm, I'm kind of, at times I can be sarcastic at times. I try to put a, you'll see when I, when it says coaches, colon it's something that i want to share with coaches you know yep. i do that yep. quite often absolutely and so i really love sharing something um you know that i've done or learned and i I'll, I'll leave you with this guys i mean this i mean this. this is not just coach speak but i learned something about the game of basketball every single week there's something that i learned that i wish i knew when i was a young coach uh you know whether it's an inbounds play or a way to teach something so I'm still in learning mode every single, you know, every day. And that's why I love the game so much is I'm constantly in, improving and learning and getting better. And when I see something I really like, 
I love passing it on to coaches. I really do. So I try to do it on Twitter. And so you can reach me at, uh, you know, at Fran for and, um, you know, that's it. I mean, I've done, again, I can't, can't thank you enough for having me on and, uh, you know, uh, make sure you tell our mutual friend, Alan Stein, that I was on and, and that we, uh, that we had fun with this. Absolutely, Fran. We can't thank you enough for jumping out with us tonight and sharing all your vast knowledge and experience in the game with both us and our audience. And to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls, ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www dot headstartbasketball.com thanks for listening to the hoop heads podcast brought to you by head start basketball